Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure. It's our great pleasure to have uh, uh, Professor Dan Suryak. This is, how you, this is how you pronounce it? Yes. Really? Did I get it right from the first time? Wow. Suryak or Churyak? Or Churyak. All right. Churyak. Okay. Professor Dan Churyak uh, in our Distinguished uh, Visitors uh, series uh, and on a very, very interesting uh, topic. But uh, uh, before we start, and as always, um, let me show you the two slides that represent the center. Um, it's in Arabic, but it's okay. I can talk in English so you'll manage. All right. This is, this is talking about the strategic direction of our center. Um, uh, strategic direction is to focus on achieving sustainable development, which can only be achieved, in our opinion, by combining economic efficiency and social justice. We are always after this green box. Okay. Any attempt to be anywhere else is unfair or bad. Either you have a strong economy that's benefiting just few people, okay, or you are spreading poverty, and we neither want this nor that. Okay. Uh, this is what we are after, and all our efforts, all our research work, all our policy-oriented recommendations are all taking us in this, uh, in this direction. Ibrahim. Okay. Having said that, we are going to start with our presentation, but let me first introduce all of my guests. Our guest, Professor Dan Shuriak, is director and, and principal of the Shuriak Consulting Company in Ottawa. He's a senior, he was a senior fellow at the Center for International Governance and Innovation. Uh, fellow in residence with the C.D. Hall Institute in Toronto. I mean, he's everywhere, huh? Distinguished fellow in <laughs> Ottawa, Waterloo, Toronto, Vancouver, Munich. Uh, where, 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 <laughs> where are you living exactly? On, on a plane? Fellow in residence with the C.D. Hall Institute. This was in Toronto. Distinguished fellow with the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, Vancouver. Associate with BKP Development Research and Consulting in Munich. He has a wide ranging experience in the analysis and formulation of public policy, development of legislation, economic analysis in support, economic analysis in support of litigation, and training and technical assistance in applied trade analysis and modeling. And he studied at McMaster University in, in Hamilton. He has a master's in economics back in 1977. It's a pleasure uh, to have you here. Uh, on the commentary side, other than myself, who's wearing several hats, uh, I would like to introduce our very good friend, uh, Dr. Hassan uh, Hayawan, who's uh, uh, a, a professor of business administration, faculty of commerce, St. James uh, University, who has a long experience of being visiting professor in, in uh, several uh, uh, universities. Uh, uh, he has uh, his PhD in the School of Business, um, Bloomington in Indiana, uh, USA. He has another PhD in Business Administration. He has an, uh, an MBA uh, from Cairo uh, University and uh, uh, a bachelor degree in Commerce from Enchamps University as well. Um, I have engineering, engineer Tariq Tawfiq, who has many hats, as I was introducing him to Dan on our way in. Too many, too many for his own good. I mean, when you put a title, we don't know what to put, okay? All right, yes, okay. He's, he's the vice chairman of the Egyptian Federation of Industries. He's the vice chairman of ECS. He is the ex-chairman of the Amcham uh, uh, American Chamber of Commerce, and he plays tennis. Okay, this was exactly the <laughs> I'm the bad guy. You're the bad guy, yeah. Chairman of Cairo Poultry Group Egypt, Egyptian company, number of companies, um, Egyptian company for starch and glucose, so he's an, an industrialist primarily, uh, by experience and by uh, education as well. Um, uh, having done the introduction, I would like to go right away to the to the presentation whose topic is actually extremely interesting because it's raising a lot of question and challenges that we are facing now that did not exist before and the big question is how do we deal with all those challenges please uh, thank you very much uh, dr abdul natif uh, i owe my uh, 
presence here actually to a former colleague um, of yours, uh, Dr. Ahmed Gilal. Who apologizes for not being here. He's traveling, unfortunately. I, I, I met Ahmed at um, uh, a board meeting at the Center for International Governance Innovation, and we uh, really struck it off. And uh, he then introduced uh, me uh, uh, to your center through Dr. Abdel Latif. And so Abla, here, Abla, Abla, Abla okay, <laughs> very good. And, um, and I'm delighted to be here. It's, it's a, also very much honored to be here. Uh, I have visited Egypt a few times before just for tourism, but it is wonderful to be here for a professional reason. Um, so um, without, without further uh, ado on, 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 the, on, on those things, um, I should jump into uh, the remarks. So we are at a point of rupture in, the, uh, in, in our global economic system. The WTO, as you know, is, is essentially now sidelined to deal with all of the disputes which are, uh, can emerge because of the uh, refusal by the United States to appoint appellate body members. Uh, there is also now uh, uh, issues regarding the, uh, the, the budget for the WTO. There's now acrimony about the staff of the WTO. All of this is small potatoes if you think about the commercial consequences of what is at stake with, with regard to the appellate body and, and so forth. My analogy here is that we are fighting over very small things and it's like a marriage. When a marriage breaks up because someone once squeezes the partner, or one partner squeezes the toothpaste in the middle and it causes a problem in the tube, the marriage is not breaking up about the toothpaste tube. It's breaking up because of other fundamentals. And I think we need to recognize that the, uh, the world economy has evolved to a point where the former rules-based system now is not working and uh, it is now um, basically sidelined. But we're also seeing populist pressures arising in various societies which are breaking out into uh, demonstrations and with people being shot and so forth. And, uh, and we also have um, the, the, uh, a, a range of heightened vulnerabilities uh, at the macroeconomic the level. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, you, you have uh, uh, heightened vulnerabilities at the macroeconomic level with massive fiscal stimulus uh, in the United States, budgets, uh, deficits at the peak of, uh, of, of an expansion that are unprecedented, raising issues about what would happen if and when the next recession hits. Interest rates around the world are negative in real terms. Uh, again, an unprecedented uh, uh, phenomenon. When I went to university, we, we heard about the zero bound. Interest rates could not go below uh, zero in, in nominal terms. We've seen that broken all over the place. So the world is in a very strange place, and the question is, what is driving all that? So the, many narratives have been uh, told. One of them is the rise of China, which has created a massive supply shock for the global economy. Uh, one of them is the, the uh, excesses of globalization. There is a very ma a number of kleptocratic tendencies in the global economy, as um, uh, the which is concentrated income at the, at, for the one percent, creating income imbalances within societies and across societies. The failure of many countries to actually develop under the system of globalization, and you also have. Um, the story of, of technology disrupting uh, uh, societies and, uh, and economies and uh, uh, undermining good jobs as robots replace physical labor. So there are all these factors at, pl uh, at play which have been, or stories that have been told to explain the world as we see it. Uh, what I would like to offer is uh, a unifying theme to try and uh, build all these things together or bring all these issues together. And that is that we are uh, going through a transition in the, in, in, the, in the nature of our economy based on the change in the essential capital asset of the age. And to try and motivate this, I'll just talk a little bit about the historical uh, transitions that we have experienced to provide you an intuition as to how this might, uh, how this new transition 
which is the age of data, might affect us going forward. So if we think about the feudal era, uh, b before 1820 or so, the key asset, production asset, was land. Land is what made people wealthy. And land is what people fought over. That's where the rents were. So in, in economic terms, the pure profits or supernormal profits. And if you think about the organization of society, the people who concentrated ownership of that key asset, the lords of the manor. If you watch um, uh, English uh, uh, TV, you might be familiar with Downton Abbey. And you have these wonderful manors where there's a family that controls all the land and everyone else is in service or renting land from them. Wars were fought over land. The Hundred Years' War between England and France was fought over who would capture the rents from Aquitaine. So land was the key asset. It structured international relations, it structured social relations, and it was a source and it structured your economy. You move forward into the machine age, and now machinery, mass production machinery became the key capital asset. That's where the rents were. Now, at that stage, in the early days of industrialization, the minimum efficient scale, I don't know how, uh, if this concept is, is, is commonly uh, known, but the, with scale economies, you have to make a large investment in production machinery, and then you, you, as you expand the number of units that you produce, the average cost falls. And it keeps falling until it hits a point where you can, it no longer falls, and then you hit the minimum efficient scale, and then in order to expand production, you have to replicate your plant, okay? So with minimum efficiency scale being large relative to the size of the economies of the, of the early industrial era, there was a tremendous push to capture global markets, export markets. This was the world uh, built by railroads and steamships to ex export uh, products. It was mercantilism 1.0, if you want to think of it that way. And the con international uh, contest was to actually capture these markets abroad. Uh, and you had this combined with, uh, with the monetary system of the age, uh, which was uh, the uh, uh, metal-based currencies, and particularly is in the post-1870 uh, era, the gold standard. In that, in that system, if you ran a trade deficit, your money supply would run down. You would have an outflow of gold, and you would have then a debt deflation period, which would be, be very destructive for your, for your society. So the economies of that age all contested for uh, global markets and for colonies, captive markets. And that was the area of colonialization. That was the era of gunboat diplomacy, where you would, ca uh, you, this, this is the opium wars in China, where the Europeans captured the ports and forced China to open its markets for their industrial goods and for opium. Uh, so this was, the, that uh, when the West ran out of co uh, places to colonize, they turned on each other and we had the industrial wars of the 20th century, the early 20th century. This was, a, 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 you can see that the contest, the mass production machinery created a contest for international rents and that led to conflict. You go now move into the latter day, uh, latter era uh, part of the of the industrial era, post war period. The global economy grew sufficiently large that minimum efficient scale was now small relative to the size of the global economy. So now you had car companies in Japan competing with car companies in, in Germany and Europe, uh, elsewhere in Europe, and in, uh, and and the United States and everywhere. You had lots of competition that was able to meet these efficient scale, the, 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 this minimum efficient scale. It was a highly competitive economy. So this now, I'm going to, how do we do this? This one here? Yeah. Okay. The way, a, a wit to, to uh, think about sort of ha what has, is happening to the rents in the system is provided by the smile curve. Um, and and uh, it, it, this was developed for the knowledge-based economy, and I'll be coming to that in a minute. 
But what you had was, and you see in the middle of, of the curve, manufacturing and standardized services generate the, the smallest amount of value added and the smallest amount of rent. Okay, so in this in this post-war industrial economy, there was no rent to capture from man, mass production manufacturing. So this was all outsourced to developing economies. Meanwhile, what where the rent was now was in, actually in R and D um, and in uh, uh, the, the various elements of design and commercialization of products, plus the marketing and advertising. That's where the rents were. And here we see now the shift towards from the, the old industrial era to, to the knowledge-based economy era, which I would date from around uh, 1980 or so. 1980 saw the uptick in patenting. It saw the introduction by the United States of the Bay Dole Act, which encouraged patenting. That was when the United States realized that intellectual property was its most valuable asset. Now what did this, so this, in this world, now the contest for rents shifted from land, from manufacturing, which is at the bottom, up the uh, two ends of the curve towards intellectual property. And here you now have the leading uh, intellectual property economy in the United States now started to introduce intellectual property provisions into its trade agreements. So you had, intellectual property had emerged in some trade agreements previously, but primarily in, in integration, deep integration uh, uh, structures. But now it showed up in the, the free trade agreement between the United States and Canada in 1989, and then later on uh, in, in the trips. And the objectives of, of these agreements now were to uh, expand the um, amount of uh, intellectual property that was protected and to intensify the enforcement and the protection for it because that was where the rents were. So now you can see that in, in this era, machinery, mass production, was no longer the source of rents. It needed protection. Land is no longer the source of rents. It needed protection to generate rents. So this is the era that we actually have in the gas WTO where land is protected, where, mach where uh, uh, the machine or, or manufacturing is increasingly protected through anti-dumping and countervailing uh, duty measures and others, and the contest, the positive contest, is for intellectual property. So we can see that the transition of, of uh, the essential capital of the age from land to machinery to intellectual property structured the economy, structured international relations and conflict, and it also structured your society. You had the wealth moved from the landed gentry of the Downton Abbey age to the tycoons of uh, Manchester and Philadelphia, and then onwards to the tech CEOs of Silicon Valley. So now, as we enter, um, we, we introduce a new essential form of capital, data, we can anticipate a similarly a, a, a pervasive transformation of our economy and society and international relations based upon what? On the pursuit of the rents that data generates. So how does data generate rents? In the first place, data uh, has been around for forever, but it was uh, very difficult to capture and to, um, and, and to utilize, to deploy as, as a capital asset until the age of um, uh, very, very powerful computers and, and very, very low cost storage. What was the first data exhaust, uh, data which was generated in all kinds of commercial transactions, now became possible to be captured, classified, and then used as, an, uh, as, as, as a, a capital asset for various purposes such as prediction and, and others. And the, the, in this context now, the companies that own data, they have got effectively a sixth, uh, sort of an industrial sixth sense. They see things that other companies don't. They see things better, more sharply. They see opportunity. And the margins that uh, data allows you to capture 
Uh, in, in the literature that we see from the business side, from the McKinsey's and the, and the Dow world, you know, 10, 20, 30 percent margin of efficiency gain, those are huge in business terms. The companies that, that access these particular margins are the ones that then become the dominant firms. So the, that's where the rent is, and so what are we seeing now in terms of international relations? We're seeing the move to introduce data chapters into trade agreements. The data chapters, uh, uh, which are advanced by the United States in particular as the, as the most, um, uh, which has the greatest offensive interests in, in data, are to prevent data localization and to ensure the free flow of data across borders. So this new oil is to flow from countries to be captured by the multinationals. And why? Because that is the source of rents. How do we know? Well, you, if you take a look at the, um, uh, uh, the uh, market value of the most valuable corporations, the, uh, the bank, Facebook, Amazon, um, et cetera, uh, uh, Apple, uh, Google, uh, these companies have on, on the order of four plus trillion dollars worth of market value. Their physical assets on their books are on the order of 225 million, that's our billion dollars, so a fraction of the market value. In between, there is, um, there is uh, standard intellectual property, uh, patents and so forth, but the large part of that is the value of data, which is used to capture business all over the place. So this is now the, 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 the place where value is stored, and who are now the, the wealthiest people in the world? They are the tech CEOs of the major companies, of the major data companies. And Jeff Bezos can afford a $60 billion divorce, <laughs> to give you a sense <laughs> of the amount of wealth that's concentrated. Um, so what we see now is that, think about the world that we grew to love, uh, or at least many of us did, in the GATT WTO era, the rules-based system. This was a world where you, the rents had been squeezed out of manufacturing and standardized services, the way to regulate this world was through rules, where you had uh, distributed value being captured around the world in small amounts, it's highly competitive. The rules-based system was a natural for that era. But in an era now where you have a handful of giant firms dominating global markets. They're not even global markets anymore. They're just a, a global data mine. This is not a world for rules-based system. This is a world for power politics. And that's where we're heading. So I hope that this, by, by, by thinking about the essential asset, capital asset of an age, we can see the transition of, from the feudal era to the machine age, uh, the machine age inspired uh, Karl Marx uh, to write uh, that's capital and inspired the concept of capitalism, uh, and then the conflict with socialism. Well, if you think about that era, it was a contest for the rents that accrued to mass production, and if those rents could go to the workers if they unionized, or if you had socialism to capture those rents, or they could go to the tycoons of industry. That structured your politics of the age. You had a new class came into being, uh, workers in urbanized settings. Um, and then you move forward to the intellectual property age. You have the concentration of income now in the people who own protected assets. That's where the wealth was. And by the way, if you think about how social democratic parties and labor parties lost their way. Well, that's because they were fighting over a gold mine after the gold was gone, okay? There was no rents anymore in manufacturing, and so there was, no, and, and there was nothing that could be done to recapture that except provide protection from trade. So that gives you kind of the ordering. Well, now we move into the characteristics the characteristics of this data-driven economy that is emerging. So, first of all, this is not an economy which is naturally conducive towards the development of competitive markets. It features powerful economies of scale in the first place. To imagine this, think about the 
Google server banks, they're massive. It requires a massive amount of investment to capture data, also then to, uh, to, uh, to classify it, to curate it, and to capitalize on it with algorithms that can then generate uh, money and profits. Um, so this, this world is not one where small companies can actually compete very easily. There's ease, ease of entry, but once they enter, they are swallowed up by, by the majors. Then there's economies of scope. To conceptualize this, think about Facebook and all the uh, information that it has on its user base. Facebook was, is very interested in adding financial information to the information it already owns. Why? Because that financial information would make all that other information way more valuable. And that's an economy of scope. So the more types of information you have, the more valuable it becomes. Therefore, the large company with the largest, with the, the greatest breadth of, of uh, data capture becomes the most powerful co company in utilizing the, that data. So this is another source of market failure. It doesn't tend towards competitive markets, it tends towards concentrated markets. Then you have network externalities. Here, this is uh, uh, another uh, important feature of the platform companies and a networked, data-driven world. Uh, you know, in the classic example, if you have, if, the only, if only one person has a telephone, it's of no value. And the more people have a telephone, the more useful it is. This naturally tends towards a tipping point where you have monopolies emerge because of the network externalities that are, and these don't exist in every single industry, but they exist certainly in many ones, in, in social media, in uh, internet search and others. That's another form of uh, powerful market failure, or a powerful source of market failure. And then there are pervasive information asymmetries. Again, I, I mentioned that you know companies that uh, have access to data and they can extract value from it, they see the world better, they see the world more finely than, uh, than do other companies. But this, is, this information asymmetry is, is, is irreducible. Now, information asymmetry always existed, even in the, the older age. Uh, but that's when data was uh, such that uh, the human mind could wrap itself around the data. And markets came into being to actually address the uh, market failures that uh, the information asymmetry uh, created. So for example, if you had a used car salesman, right, they, have, they know what's what that used car is like. They have an information advantage over a potential client. So that information advantage would result in market failure. So markets created, there's a market for lemons came into being, where information sources provided the customer the information uh, to address this information asymmetry. But you can't do that with big data. Okay. Markets don't come into existence to actually correct for the data that Google has, the, the data advantage that Google has, because there's only a monopoly. That data is proprietary. It's not something that can be accessed by data, by, sorry, by markets. So this is an irreducible market source of market failure. Uh, and finally, th then you think, combine these four uh, these four sources of market failure, and this is a, a world which leads naturally to superstar firms and not to competitive markets. And this stands a lot of things that we know of, of, that we think we know about the way the global economy works. It stands it on its head. For example, the only country that has developed competitive uh, or com competitors for the U.S. Uh, internet giants is China. And how did they do it? by virtue of having a, a, the great firewall. In this case, competition emerges not from lowering barriers, but from raising barriers. Yeah. That's the opposite of the way the world worked in the industrial era. So you have to now think about how to generate competitive global market structures, not necessarily through liberalization, but through some form of managed trade or managed agreements. Now, this world is going to lead to uh, uh, a new phenomenon which will break on us like a tsunami in, in 
in pretty soon, uh, in pretty a short course. And this, I, I call this um, machine knowledge capital. This is basically um, a, a hyper competent artificial intelligence application that will capture global markets. Uh, these applications are being developed in thousands of companies around the world, even as we are sitting here today, and they will be coming on the market shortly. Um, think about, for example, the application that's being developed now to grade university term papers. Okay, you have, it, it, this will relieve a lot of teachers of, 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 of responsibility that the, the, the company that generates the dominant or the best uh, form of, you know, term paper grading will capture global markets. That will capture, the rest that will generate, that will accrue to that particular AI will be enormous and that will go to, to one company, one person. And this will be happen across the board. In, uh, in various applications where a company finds the breakthrough, it will capture those trends. In the industrial era, there was a stylized fact that the labor share and the capital share of income were more or less flat. And that, that stylized fact was captured in the Cobb-Douglas production function, which treated that as a law of nature. After 1980, with the dawn of the knowledge-based economy and the introduction of, uh, or the, the, the period when intellectual property became the essential capital asset, the profit share of GDP started to rise on trend because now you had a protected asset capturing rents. In the data-driven world, this will intensify. We've already had, even now, uh, 40 years into the knowledge-based era and the beginning of the, of the data-driven era, we are seeing internal tensions within society over income distribution. The tremendous skewing of income to the 1%. That was a phenomenon of the knowledge-based world. This will continue in the data-driven world. So we can anticipate a, a further intensification of tensions within society. And of course, as I mentioned, the conflict between societies to capture those rents internationally. So, in terms of the way that machine knowledge capital will impact on societies, it will do, it will provide the same kind of competition to white collar work that robots provided to blue collar work over the past 20, 30 years. And we've seen that the blue, that the, the impact of, of technology, of robots on blue collar work led to the uh, uh, devastation of many communities because the jobs disappeared, the good, job, the good jobs disappeared. Now that will happen to white collar work. Think about economies like Canada, which is based upon white collar work. Based upon the degrees that we, that, that we went to university to get to acquire the credentials, we borrowed money on that. Okay, uh, our financial structure is geared towards the, uh, the, the uh, uh, human capital. And now that will be competed away by machine knowledge capital. You can see the stresses in society which will emerge from that. So that is, uh, you have a, a market failure which will drive division within society. And this machine knowledge capital is unlike uh, a, a physical a robots, machine knowledge capital can be reproduced at zero marginal cost and, and distributed globally as software at almost zero marginal cost as well. Robots are large, difficult to produce, and difficult to deploy. So machine knowledge capital will have a far more rapid and more pervasive impact on white collar work than robots had on blue collar work. In addition, there's more. <laughs> the, when you combine machine knowledge capital with robots, you now have flexible robots. The pressure on, on blue-collar work, on, on manual labor, will intensify even as it intensifies now as, as it is introduced for white-collar work, for professional jobs. So again, our societies are going to face a, a, a massive 
new pressures on income distribution and the organization of our society, and this will be pervasive. So there are, there are a few other um, uh, sort of major developments that will happen in addition to this internal strife. Uh, as I mentioned, you have the, this is now the new source of, of, of rents internationally. So what will we see internationally? Well, we will see countries seeking to capture that particular uh, uh, asset, the, the, the rents that which flow to that asset. And you will have now issues related uh, to what artificial intelligence applications we will permit into our economies. So we can we have already, for example, one area where we've seen uh, uh, the, the 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 whole waterfront covered by three countries. This is the use of artificial intelligence in legal proceedings. So China has created an artificial intelligence court where artificial intelligence runs the proceedings. France has completely banned it. You can't use artificial intelligence at all. The United States is in the middle and, and uses artificial intelligence to determine whether uh, a defendant should be held uh, uh, in jail pending trial. You, and every, every other place in between uh, will be filled in by different societies. So now you will see non-tariff measures will emerge to, to limit the flow of artificial intelligence globally. Artificial intelligence will, be, will face NTMs the way agricultural products face SPS measures. Uh, this will be the new SPS of the digital age. You can see the inherent conflict and the need for some form of, of adjudication emerging. You'll also have, of course, then the uh, issue of strategic trade and investment. Now, in the 1980s, when you had the emergence of dynamic random access memories, DRAMs, and, uh, and then the market for civil aviation uh, really burgeoned, you had the emergence of strategic trade and investment competition between the major industrial powers, the United States and Japan. This, in fact, inspired the, uh, uh, an uh, academic article on the subject, the strategic trade policy. Now, what did we see in that context? We saw the use of anti-dumping and countervailing measure, unilateral protection. We, had, we saw things like voluntary export restraints used by the United States to limit the flow of Japanese product into the US. Um, we saw currency wars. Uh, the Plaza Accord of 1985 was used by the US to drive the Japanese exchange rate to double it in order to limit the flow of, of the competitiveness of the Japanese competitors um, in the United States market. And we saw something called Structural Impediments Initiative. This was the US trying to pry open the Japanese industrial structure that was leading to its competitive advantage in trams. Fast forward to today, what are we seeing uh, between the US and China? Well, we're seeing unilateral measures being used, tariffs. We're seeing, uh, uh, we're seeing uh, now the introduction of currency manipulation uh, charges to raise China's exchange rate. Uh, we're seeing uh, an attempt to um, rewrite the rules uh, uh, in the WTO, not through the WTO negotiations, but externally to, through the US, EU, Japan initiative on, on China. And uh, you are seeing now the, um, uh, with, with regard to the um, Chinese industrial structure, something that resembles structural impediments initiative, you can call it 2.0, where the USTR developed this long list of, of measures that would, that would change the Chinese economy and undermine its advantage in this area. So we're seeing a complete replay uh, from the 1980s to the current era this is strategic trade policy playing itself out, and it is playing itself out over the, the, the contest for rents. Um, how are we doing for time, by the way? Getting very close. So I, I'm, I'm going to fast forward a little bit, OK? Um, you're happy? OK. <laughs> so um, you have something else, which is the acceleration of innovation. And this is really important. Um, the, the first uh, uh, computer program that learned to play Go and beat uh, a Go champion was based upon 
uh, programming uh, lots and lots of human uh, games into the system and to learn from human uh, uh, patterns. The second version of DeepMind that uh, learned to play Go learned it by, without reference to human uh, players, it was given the rules and played, I think, you know, some like 180 years worth of uh, human time in a, over a weekend, more or less. And the second version beat the first version 100 to zero in match play, and it learned that in a couple of days. That's acceleration. There's been, a, in a video game uh, um, uh, uh, context, a, a, a computer program has been developed, which won, oops, uh, and it, it learned about 45,000 years of human time into six months. That's compression of time to learn. Today, today, computer uh, new computer chips are not designed by human uh, minds. They're designed by other chips, okay, by neural networks. This is accelerating the pace of change tremendously. And so, this when we think about uh, this machine knowledge capital, which will be coming at us, uh, is coming at us very, very rapidly. Um, I noted in this context that um, in, the, in the whole uh, issue about Huawei being denied American technology, in one redesign cycle, Huawei eliminated all the American-made components in its new cell phone. Uh, they may not be the very best in, input products, that the, the replacements aren't, aren't necessarily up to the standards of, of the, the, the leading edge US products, but they, they have a very good functioning phone without that. And th within one or two years, by investing a few hundred billions of dollars in this area, they will accelerate the pace of innovation fast enough to actually probably decouple fully from the United States products. That is acceleration that's coming fast at us. This makes the concept of a technology race almost moot. If innovation is moving so fast, then everyone will get to the technology frontier almost at the same time. And the difference in six months or a year or two will be almost immaterial down the line. So this is something that's very important for understanding how this international uh, framework for in, in this data-driven economy will unfold. The second thing that's about the movement of innovation from the human mind into machine space is that in the advantage, the established advantage that the leading Western uh, countries had in innovation essentially evaporates. The advantage the U.S. had uh, over China was in its elite universities. It gathered the leading minds from around the world into those universities, and that drove that, that uh, technological development. Now, when it's neural nets that are generating the innovation, the, it's a function of how much you invest in server banks. So there's a famous quote from Frederick the Great, and I think Stalin also, also used it, that in war, God was on the side of the country with the biggest divisions, or the most divisions. In the data-driven world, God is on the side of the country with the biggest server banks. And that's not necessarily the United States. That could be China, that could be any country that chooses to make the investment, and we're talking large investments, is going to be competitive. So this is an, a brave new world uh, that we have to, to address. The other fascinating thing about data is that it is, has public good characteristics. Okay? Whereas physical capital was a private good, intellectual property by definition was protected for the sole owner of that property. Land had, could have title uh, and, uh, uh, for ownership. Data does not. The da valuable data, it, for example, when you move in a public space, the world sees you. You don't own that data. Everyone who sees you owns that data just as much. If you enter into a financial transaction, there's at least two parties to that transaction. You don't own the, data, the information about that transaction. You and the other party do. Plus the bank that mediates the transaction. Plus the, uh, the telecommunications company over, the, over whose wires that information flows. Data is inherently social or public in nature. And, it doesn't, and on top of that, the value of data is not 
in the fact that it can, is transacted in markets with a price and, and invoices and receipts, it is captured and then it's turned into data banks that then drive the development of artificial intelligence applications. It can be sold, but in secondary markets. So if you think about a, a, a data company being bought for $4 billion on, in, in a merger and acquisition uh, uh, a play, it's a data play. The value of the company is in the data, but the data itself, there is no ownership to it. There is no receipt, there is no invoice. So we have a curious fundamental new asset for which there is no analogy in terms of how to regulate it, how to administer that economy. Um, and it raises all kinds of regulatory issues as well. So to, to underscore, we are in a new age with a new capital asset the regulation of which we have no analogy for. We know that it's very, very valuable. We know that it's going to drive uh, seismic shocks through our economies and our societies. And uh, in terms of just kind of wrapping up my talk here, I, I, I guess I want to um, do two things um, very quickly. I want to point out the fact that at the international level, the countries that are investing are very limited in, in, in terms of the major investment. This, this curve here on, on, the, on, the, on the left side of the, of the vertical, okay, this is public investment space. On the right side is private investment space. Along the, the bottom uh, uh, line, you have the percent of GDP. Okay, but in terms of the of the vertical line is the absolute value of that. So a small country investing a large share of GDP will have only a small amount of investment. Okay, a large country investing a small percentage of its of its GDP will have a large investment. So who do, who is it leading? Well, out there in private spaces, U.S. private is way out there at the top, and over here, U.S. public investment is at the top. China is there, out there in private, and, in the, uh, and it's basically parallel with the EU uh, in terms of the level of investment. Um, and everyone else is actually down at the bottom. And developing countries are not on the map at all. And this is, this is where all the future value of the economy is going to be. So you can see that to generate some form of global compacts, some form of global agreement that is win-win for, de for developing countries as well as even the middle-income countries as well as countries like Canada is going to be very, very difficult. And this leads us then to the question of what form of um, uh, international regime we will have. I, I have listed out here a number of, of, of different aspects of the WTO agreement that would have to be modified to adapt it to the, di to the digital age. I start with something that I'm, I'm, I'm promoting this, the trade related aspects of data exchange. It has a nice acronym, TRADE. This would be the regime to govern trade in data. And this would try and maximize the free flow of data so that we do have a globalized world where countries have access to uh, data flows to, to develop their own data-driven economies. But it would be con conditional on exceptions for sovereignty. So we know that in this data-driven world, um, we have got significant vulnerabilities to misinformation, to interference in election processes uh, from you know, the Cambridge Analytica scandals and all this, uh, the Russian interference in the U.S. election. These things will have to be controlled. There, there will be exceptions for the free flow of data to, for the nations to guard their sovereignty. National security will be a, 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 a touch, a, a very, very sensitive area. The, we, we already have stories um, of Russia and, and the United States implanting malware in each other's electrical grids, which could then be used to shut down the electrical grid in a time of conflict. Imagine now as you have the Internet of Things is rolled out and you have smart cars, you have cities which are running on artificial intelligence. 
uh, we have the prospect of, if, if, if you think about self-driving cars or using artificial intelligence to uh, uh, do traffic, think of cars flowing through a city like schools of fish, all moving in, in, in tandem to the same uh, signals uh, uh, which are coming from the Internet of Things uh, servers are planned around the city. Imagine how Cairo would be transformed if you had the hectic, chaotic traffic patterns you have now somehow smoothed out and accelerated through an artificial intelligence application. And then think about how the, the vulnerability that you would have if someone were to implant a malware on that and shut it down. So you can see that we would have both cybersecurity issues galore and we would have if, uh, uh, efficiency opportunities of, of which would be very very attractive and we would need to regulate this so we would need national security exceptions think about now FTAs for uh, free trade agreements require that substantially all trade be liberalized in order to provide the uh, the um, the preferences to a, a specific set of countries the European Union has got a digital single market uh, in the works well, what are the rules for substantially all trade when it comes to data? Hmm? Well, I don't think we know. And then there's the issue of taxation and value sharing. This is on the e-commerce negotiation and the, the moratorium on the establishment of, of, tax, of taxes or tariffs on electronic transmission. Countries are moving globally to capture some of that value. In the, in, in, in the physical world, Companies had to have a physical presence in a country to extract value, and that physical presence could be taxed. That's not the case in the digital world, and so this is not a tolerable situation for the long run. So we have a very complex um, a trade regime to develop under the WTO. Competition policy was a Singapore issue, so shuffled off to the side in, in, the, uh, in the Uruguay round, um, but competition policy will be front and center in a world which is not naturally conducive to, uh, comp to, to competitive markets, but leads to monopolies. We will have to work that out. With uh, investment, the new CFIUS regulations in the U.S. concerning foreign investment into the U.S. introduced three key words, technology, infrastructure, and data. These are going to be the, 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 the hot spots in terms of what is the allowable flow of foreign direct investment into countries. In the industrial age, everyone was simply fighting to get FDI into your country. Now everyone's going to be concerned about these three areas and limiting the flows in. TRIPS. With TRIPS, we had uh, th this was always a, a problem in international trade because intellectual property it's not a win-win uh, agreement. The, all the rents flow to the handful of countries that, that uh, own most of the IP in the world. So that's why developing countries, and in fact most countries, resisted strongly the intensification of protection for IP. But at least intellectual property, patents, copyrights, these are public information. Okay, and they expire, they're term limited. So you have at least the prospect that down the line, you can access this information if you, if you uh, protect it for the first 20 years or the first 70 years in copyright. With data, that's not the case. It's a trade secret. They will, the protection will never expire. You never get access to it. Algorithms are secret. So what we're seeing is the introduction of new expansive trade secrets laws in the U.S. and the EU to capture the rents flowing to data, and no one will ever get a, a chance at that. So how can you structure an international agreement on intellectual property where every country will be paying and, and only a handful will be benefiting? It's not going to work. We're going to have to work this out in terms of what is going to be a legitimate uh, wealth sharing agreement. Uh, and as I mentioned, with machine knowledge capital, the rents here are going to go through, this, uh, through the roof in terms of even conventional intellectual property. And then there's subsidies in industrial policy and development. And um, here, we have to recognize that if, if the fundamental asset of your age, data, has public good characteristics, that will require public investment in a level and in a form 
that the WTO agreement on, on subsidies and countervailing measures does not contemplate. In public investment will not be a distortion, it will be a necessity. Now, in the world that we live in right now, China has invested heavily in this space. And we are now, all other countries are following suit there while trying to, to, to get China to stop. But in point of fact, that was the right call. This is an area that requires public investment to a degree that we're not prepared, that we were not prepared for in the West. We were late getting off the, um, uh, uh, onto, uh, onto this uh, uh, train, and China uh, stole a march as it were, which is the co a major source of the conflict, but this will require public investment. And we need to actually re review how we, we uh, then um, uh, deal with that. I, I want to say here a few things about the China conflict to, to wrap up and also the implications for development uh, uh, policies. There's a few things that we got really wrong about China. The first one is on the why they became highly competitive. When China joined the WTO, China did not get ob uh, obtain liberalization by other countries. It liberalized itself. The most fundamental theory theorem of trade policies is called the learner symmetry theorem. And it says that a tax on your imports is a tax on your exports. So when China lowered its tariff barriers on joining the WTO, it was lowering its, the tariffs that it was facing abroad effectively. And that's what led to the explosion of Chinese exports. I wrote a paper at the time that was uh, reflected Western thinking about the impact of uh, WTO accession on China. The question was, could China handle the new competition when it lowered its tariffs? The real impact was on the reduction of non-tariff measures effectively facing China. So then, when the West reacted by putting up all kinds of uh, anti-dumping measures against China, we were also then also putting up non-tariff barriers to our own entry into the Chinese market. And what did we see? We saw then companies, Western companies, started to complain about how, oh, the Chinese market is getting more difficult. But these were barriers of our own creation. Okay, so we got China wrong both times. First, when we, when we uh, 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 got China into the WTO, and then we, then we put barriers up to, uh, to Chinese exports. So, and the third thing that we got basically wrong was the idea that the pervasive subsidies are a source of competitive advantage. China's tax share of GDP is around 20%. You can't run a modern economy on 20% of GDP in taxes. And you see China today as a modern economy. The difference between the 20% range where China is at and the 40% where, uh, where the developed countries are, that's, that's covered by state-owned enterprises through subsidies and whatnot, these companies have the burden of delivering the public policies, the public infrastructure, et cetera, that the society needs, and they get the benefit of those. I think I ran out of the and, and they get the benefit of the, of the uh, support from the state. At the end of the day, it's really not a major issue. China's imports and its exports are roughly balanced, and that's really the most important thing. But this, this getting China wrong uh, led to the conflict, and that is now out of the, uh, probably out of control, perhaps even for a generation. But what China got right was not really related to that. What China got right was the fact that its path to development was based upon technology and companies. When you take a look at the global Fortune 500 today, China has got 126 companies which are on that list now, and it is uh, pursuing technology. When I was doing APEC in the 1990s, you could, I could not talk to a Chinese official for more than five minutes before they would start talking about how do we get technology. I talked to any other developing country and they would want to say, how do we get to sell t-shirts to the Americans? Okay, The way to development is not by selling t-shirts to, to the United States or to Europe. It is by getting technology, technology, technology. And that's what China got right. And companies, 
And it doesn't seem to me to matter whether the companies are state-owned or private. Just that you have companies and lots of them. So I tell this story, I told uh, an app with this, uh, uh, that, that when I, I go to a developing country, I ask, not what your GDP per capita is, but how many companies do you have? And I'll give you the, the story from Bhutan. So Bhutan is a country of 800,000 people, and they told me they had 500 registered companies. And I said, do you know how many companies you would have if you had the same population and density of companies as Canada does? And the answer is 25,500. The, gap, the income gap between Bhutan and Canada is not that large. Bhutan is a recently, um, you know, it's getting into the, 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 middle in, uh, the, the lower middle income class. But the gap in companies is massive. And that's what China got right. It's got companies up the yin yang. And so the development space that we're looking at in, in the WTO, we develop rules. We need rules that will encourage technology transfer and rules that will encourage company development. Those concepts are not at all established within the WTO framework, and that's what's needed. And if I had one piece of advice for Egypt, based upon all the stuff that I've ever learned, it is think companies and think technology. Um, and it's only when you get that combination in place that you will have the kind of development that you see in China. So thank you very much for, for your attention. I think that's going to be Thank, thank you very much for an extremely enriching and, and eye-opening lecture on what we are getting ourselves into, okay? what the world is getting itself into, and, and where we're going and whether we're ready for it uh, or not. You, you, you captured the incredible gap that exists between the system that is running the economy, the former rules-based system, and the situation today with the data-driven economy and with the technology. We have an institutional setup that is trying to run an economy of a completely different nature. And this is a, a huge, huge challenge. Uh, I have a lot of comments myself, but I will refrain and I will pass the word first to Dr. Hassan Hayat.